It is midnight and you're tuning in to Nightline with me, Norzi Patwanche. Here are the top stories. Putrajaya incurred 620 million ringgit in losses in 2020 due to financial mismanagement. And COVID-19 self-test kits to cost less than 10 ringgit, says Deputy Domestic Trade Minister. It's less than 24 hours before the 2022 budget will be tabled by Finance Minister Datuk Sri Tunku Zafrul Abdul Aziz. The annual document will contain the government's strategy and policy in guiding the national economy towards recovery. For 2022, the budget will support the concept of the Malaysian family as the main pillar, taking into account the input of the people from all levels. And that's to ensure that no group is left behind. In the 74th Laksana report, Datu Sri Tunku Zafrul said the 2022 budget will focus on 3M, which is recovery, resilience and reform. Emphasis is given on the values of inclusivity, togetherness and gratefulness to to ensure that no Malaysian family is left behind. Among what's expected in the 2022 budget are significant direct and high-impact benefits to every level of society. Various programs and initiatives have been and will be implemented under the Malaysian family umbrella. The 2022 budget will remain expansionary next year as the government will continue to spend more than their revenue to create a more positive impact to Malaysia's economic growth. Economists say they expect the country's recovery to be better managed in 2022 considering the external economic environment which is seeing better traction in terms of improvements to global trades. According to Bank Islam Chief Economist Mohammad Afzanizam Abdul Rashid, the budget deficit is expected to continue to remain fairly sizable, albeit slightly lower than the estimated fiscal deficit of 6.5 to 7 percent of the gross development product GDP this year. So probably next year we are looking uh, around perhaps 6 percent to 6.5 percent in terms of the fiscal deficit. So in that sense, um, the fiscal policy will continue to, make, to remain uh, expansionary. Although there are uh, certain cases or rather some concerns over resurgence of uh, new cases, but generally speaking, uh, at least for now, the, the, the view in the next 12 months or so uh, is going to be uh, positive for the global economy and inevitably will actually help to improve our uh, um, Malaysian economy. Mohammad Afzanizam also says with the looming 15th general election and Malacca state election next month, it is imperative for the government to stay vigilant as the country's recovery remains vulnerable to the risk of another sudden surge of COVID-19 cases. In this regard, he says the healthcare sector will continue to be a key priority in the federal budget, with COVID-19 vaccine booster shots to likely be a mainstay item in the government's expenditure, thus requiring more allocation for this purpose. With the number of self-employed Malaysians rising to 17% in 2020 compared to 15.6% in 2016, The Economist also expects more resources will be directed to capacity building for existing and incoming entrepreneurs. He also hopes that the enactment of the Fiscal Responsibility Act will come into fruition soon as this legislation will provide a clear guideline on how government resources should be used and in a more sustainable manner. Meanwhile, Trika Malaysia Chairman Dr. Varinder Jit Singh believes that a new tax will not be introduced in the 2022 budget as the public has gone through a rough time during the pandemic. He also expects this budget to have a large deficit, just like in 2021. And uh, so, therefore, I don't expect any new taxes. I expect a focus on the existing taxes uh, in terms of improving efficiency collection and so on and so forth, uh, focusing on things like the underground economy and uh, those who should be paying taxes and haven't paid. Um, but this budget is more about, is going to continue fundamentally what has been done 
in uh, the last year's budget as well, in terms of trying to help re uh, businesses and individuals recover. He also feels that now is not the right time to impose more tax on the rich or certain groups that have increased their wealth or profited during the pandemic to help lower-income people. Instead, the focus should be on whether the government has the capacity to borrow more money, which in turn can be used to help the underprivileged, struggling businesses and enhance the healthcare sector before reviewing the tax regime. He also points out that the government should continue certain measures and incentives or introduce special deductions in relation to COVID-19, such as for employers who incurred expenses to manage their workforce and business amid the pandemic, COVID-19 screening tests for workers, technology adoption and work-from-home assistance. He also warns that giving too many reliefs and incentives to a broad segment of society could lead to the country losing potential tax revenue and it should be given to targeted sectors instead. Non-compliance of federal ministries and departments with financial management has led to issues involving irregular payments, loss of public funds and wastage amounting to 620 million ringgit last year. Auditor General Dato Ning Azman Ning Abdul Majid said this in a statement after the Auditor General's report on the federal government's financial statements and the 2020 federal ministries and departments compliance audit were tabled at the Dewan Rakyat on Thursday. He said from the 510 million ringgit in irregular payments, almost 500 million ringgit involved payments for maintenance service claims without being verified at the National Security Council level. Of the 104.8 million loss in public funds, about 81.7 million ringgit involved unclaimed penalties not imposed by the Immigration Department, while around 4.8 million ringgit involved equipment that was received late and not installed at Istana Budaya. Dato Nik Azman said that overall, the federal government had a deficit of 87.645 billion ringgit, with a deficit to GDP ratio of 6.2%, compared to 3.4% or 51.37 billion ringgit in 2019. The federal government's financial statements showed a true and fair view of the government's financial position for 2020 and its accounting records orderly and up to date. COVID-19 self-test kits could look cost less than 10 ringgit in the near future. Deputy Domestic Trade and Consumer Affairs Minister Russell Wahid on Thursday revealed that several suppliers have informed the ministry that they are willing to sell their test kits for below 10 ringgit. Dalam masa dekat sebelum uh, bulan depan, ianya akan dijual di bukan sahaja farmasi ataupun di kedai-kedai uh, ubat, tapi ianya akan diluaskan, dijual di mall-mall, uh, di uh, chain store dan juga akan dimasukkan ke uh, sesetengah sel minyak. Jadi ini akan memudahkan lagi pengguna untuk mendapatkan test kit ini dan juga untuk memastikan bahawa berlaku persaingan sihat. Kerana hari ini harga jualannya lah hampir RM20, tapi kita mendapat keyakinan daripada pengeluar ini, mereka meyakinkan kita bahawa ada setengahnya akan jual bawah daripada RM10. He said this when tabling the Trade Descriptions Amendment Act 2021 in the Dewan Rakyat on Thursday, speaking on the mechanism to determine the reliability of the self-test kit, which will be sold at a cheaper price. Dr. Rosul said the kit will be approved by the Medical Device Authority, MDA. Currently, the ceiling retail price for the self-test kits is 19 ringgit 90 sen, while the wholesale price is 16 ringgit. The COVID-19 infectivity rate, or r not continued an upward trend with an r not of 0.94 as of Wednesday. The rate was 0.91 on Tuesday, 0.89 on Monday and 0.88 on Sunday. Health Director General Tan Sri Dr. Nur Hisham Abdullah said the r not in Negeri Sembilan remained at 1.02 highest among all states, followed by Kuala Lumpur at 1.0 and Malacca at 0.98.
He said Malaysia recorded 6,377 fresh cases as of noon on Thursday. Of the fresh cases, a total of 98.4 percent were under categories 1 and 2, while the remaining 1.6 percent were under categories 3, 4 and 5. Malaysia and Singapore have begun talks on opening their borders to each other under a dedicated vaccinated travel lane where air travellers will be allowed entry. Tourism, Arts and Culture Minister Datuk Sri Nancy Shukri said she had earlier met with her Singaporean counterpart to discuss the preparations as well as standard operating procedures on Wednesday. Esok hari saya akan berbincang dengan Singapura dengan uh, Menteri uh, Trade ya, so tourism mereka di bawah Menteri uh, penama uh, Minister of Trade ya. Jadi insyaallah lah kita sebab Menteri lain di, uh, di Malaysia ini kita ada MOT Minister of Transport, uh, Minister of Health, Minister of um, Foreign Affairs mereka masing-masing bercakap dengan Menteri-Menteri uh, uh, counterpart mereka di Singapura juga uh, demi untuk melancarkan lagi uh, perancangan kita dan. Uh, Terdapat, I think uh, yesterday we were around, cakap mengenai vaccinated travel plan, er, travel lane, lane itu. Jadi uh, ini akan kita um, teruskan perbincangan insya Allah pada esok hari. Dan mungkin kita akan umumkan, uh, bukan saya umum, uh, itu terpaksa kita bawakan kepada uh, uh, Mesyuarat National Security Council, uh, MKN, untuk uh, melulus dan juga uh, akan uh, yang amat berhormat, Perdana Menteri yang akan mengumumkannya kalau sudah semuanya berjalan dengan baik, lancar. Ya. Commenting on the arrival of international tourists, Datuk Sri Nancy said all industry players are ready to accept the arrival of foreign tourists according to standard operating procedures or SOPs set by the NSC. The Kepung Health Office has slapped Barisan National with a 10,000 ringgit compound for violating the standard operating procedures for Phase 4 of the National Recovery Plan. The Health Ministry said the compound, under the Prevention and Control of Infectious Diseases Act, was issued following a social event held at the World Trade Centre Kuala Lumpur on Wednesday. BN became the second party to be compounded after the Malaysian Democratic Unity Party, or MUDA, which was issued a compound of 4,000 ringgit after being accused of not following police instructions not to continue holding a media conference session in Malacca. The 2022 budget short-term needs and long-term financial sustainability, decisions to bolster growth. Continuity of aid, rebuilding fiscal resilience. Driving socio-economic recovery activities and the country's latest economic growth forecast. MIR Head of Research Dr Shankaran Nambia speaks with Money Matters this Saturday at 5pm only on DVTGA. Japan wants to further enhance relations and cooperation with Malaysia through various media platforms offered by Media Prima Berhad or MPB. Japanese Ambassador to Malaysia Oka Hiroshi said it is important for both parties to work together through various sectors including business and education for the benefit and prosperity of both countries. Fortunately, there has been uh, enormous uh, achievements that uh, British has made over the last 40 years through the implementation of the Lucas policies in all the fields, in the business fields, in education, etc. So there is a good, the solid basis for us to expand cooperation based on the uh, solid trust, mutual trust between the Malaysians and the Japanese. He said this during a visit to Sri Pantas in Bandar Utama on Thursday. Also present were MPB Group Chairman Datuk Sri Dr. Said Hussein Aljunid, MPB Group Managing Director Rafiq Razali, Omnia Media Prima CEO Datuk Michael Chan and Media Prima Television Network CEO Datuk Khairul Anwar Saleh. Hiroshi was then briefed for an hour to explore the potential for collaboration that could be achieved with MPB. On his first visit to Sri Pantas, 
Hiroshi was then taken to see behind-the-scenes services and operations of MPB's subsidiaries, including Rev Media Group, Media Prima Audio and Media Prima Newsroom. Still to come on Nightline, man claims trial to cheating, pretending to be Datuk Sri Panglima. Stay tuned. Impact Cooperation, Sindran Bahad, has agreed to deliberate with its board of directors and stakeholders to rename its Timah Whiskey and change the image displayed on the product label. Domestic Trade and Consumer Affairs Minister Datuk Sri Alexander Nantalingi said the company has requested for one week to come up with a decision on the matter. He said this was the outcome achieved in a meeting between the government and the company representatives on Wednesday. Communications and Multimedia Minister Tan Sri Anwar Musa, Minister in the Prime Minister's Department for Religious Affairs Idris Ahmad and National Unity Minister Datuk Halimah Mohamad Sadiq also joined in the meeting. Datuk Sri Alexander Nanta said the meeting, held online, was conducted in a harmonious way in line with the Keluarga Malaysia concept to reach an amicable solution for the good of the country. He also said the meeting on Wednesday was a follow-up to the first meeting that was held between Wine Park Corporation and the Intellectual Property Corporation of Malaysia, or My IPO, on October 25th. The ministry, through My IPO, said it will improve procedures involving various ministries and related agencies so that the same issues do not repeat. In Johor, a man has claimed trial in two courts in Johor Bahru for pretending to be a Datuk Sri Panglima and for cheating. In the first court, 47-year-old Feroz Musa was charged with two counts of admitting to be a Datuk Sri Panglima and pleaded not guilty when the charges were read in front of Judge Dato Ahmad Kamal Arifin Ismail. According to the charge sheets, Feroz admitted that he had been awarded the Datuk Sri Panglima title, which is an offence under the Johor Emblems, Titles and Awards Prevention of Improper Use Enactment. He allegedly committed the offence on June 26 last year at Lakin Perdana and on January 8 this year at Jalan Padiria in Bandar Baru Uda. Meanwhile, in a separate court, Feroz was charged with using a Datuk Sri title to entice a woman into depositing 11 1,600 ringgit into his bank account between December 24th last year and January 5th this year. He pleaded not guilty when the charge was read in front of Magistrate Zuhaini Zulkafli at the Johor Bahru Magistrate's Court. Magistrate Zuhaini set bail at 3,000 ringgit and next mention on November 14th. <laughs> Third Chinese city placed under COVID-19 lockdown. This and more when we return.
Russia's capital went into partial lockdown Thursday for 11 days as the nation officially recorded more than 40,000 new COVID-19 infections and 1,159 deaths. Under the new restriction, all non-essential services, including retail outlets, restaurants and sporting and entertainment venues, will be closed until November 7th, along with schools and kindergartens. However, only shops selling food, medicine and other essentials will remain open during the period. The lockdown comes ahead of a nationwide week-long workplace shutdown from October 30th. So far, Russia has officially reported an overall nearly 8.4 million COVID-19 cases and over 235,000 deaths. China placed a third city under lockdown on Thursday to tackle COVID-19 numbers with around 6 million people now under orders to stay at home. The world's most populous nation is currently grappling with small outbreaks in at least 11 provinces. The resurgence prompted officials this week to lock down Lanzhou City with a population of over 4 million and aging in the Inner Mongolia region. After confirming one new case, authorities in Heihe in Heilongjiang province followed suit on Thursday, ordering people to stay at home and forbidding residents from leaving the far northern city except in emergencies. Tens of thousands more people remain under targeted lockdowns of home compounds or rather housing compounds in several cities including Beijing. Laotian police have netted Asia's biggest ever single seizure of illegal drugs, finding 55 million methamphetamine pills in the back of a beer truck, a United Nations official confirmed on Thursday. UN Office of Drugs and Crime Regional Representative Jeremy Douglas said the 55.6 million meth tablets and 1.5 tons of crystal meth seized late on Wednesday is a record for a single seizure in the region. Authorities arrested the driver of a beer truck in Bokeo province, northern Laos, which is part of the so-called Golden Triangle. Douglas said the spike in volume of drugs seized in Laos was due to a shifting of smuggling routes inside Myanmar as a result of unrest in border areas since a coup in February. Bayern Munich suffer their heaviest defeat since 1978. Sports is coming up next.
Sports Football Under-23 AFC Asian Cup qualifiers. The National Under-22 notched their second win of the campaign as they recorded a narrow 1-0 victory over hosts Mongolia in their second match in Group J on Thursday. Trunganu FC2 striker Mohamed Nur Azva Fikri Azha once again emerged the hero as he scored a late goal in the first half to help Malaysia collect three valuable points. With the win, Malaysia remained at the top of Group J with six points, while Thailand and Mongolia, who have each collected one point, are in second and third place. Malaysia will close the group stage against Thailand at the same venue this Sunday. Still on football, the German Cup, Bayern Munich has crashed out of the second round after a 5-0 defeat to Borussia Mönchengladbach. Bayern were immediately on the back foot when Coadio Kone pounced on a loose ball in the second minute to score the opener. The Bavarians were already 2-0 down 10 minutes later after Jonas Hoffmann found Remy Benzabaini who netted his first goal of the night. Benzabaini eventually added his second from the spot six minutes later after Lucas Hernandez brought down Bril Embolo in the penalty area. Hopes of a Bayern fight back after the break were dashed in the 51st minute when Mbolo himself nabbed a loose ball in the box to make it 4-0 before completing his brace six minutes later after slotting the ball neatly past Manuel Neuer to complete the route. That item wraps up Nightline this time around. We leave you with a dramatic moment of powerful waves destroying a fisherman's boat, leaving him struggling for his life in the surf as the tail end of Typhoon Kompasu hit the Philippines recently. I'm Nurzi Pawanchi. Thanks for watching.